Hello and welcome, I'm Alice Gerdyuk and you're watching Head to Head with UATV. Five years since the Severomaidan revolution, Ukraine is fighting for its survival as an independent and viable state. At its heart, the revolution was a demand for creating an economy and society based on Western norms and values, so focusing on economy, what has changed for Ukraine in recent years? To discuss this, we welcome to the studio today Pavlo Kuchta, deputy head of the Strategic Advisory Group for Supporting Ukrainian Reforms. Hello and thank you for being with us today, Hello. Mr. Kuchta. So back in 2013-2014, uh, the state of Ukraine's economy was uh, frightening. Basically, the country was pillaged by the ousted former President Viktor Yanukovych and its supporters, his supporters. So uh, since then, how much uh, did uh, Ukraine recover? Yeah, so we, 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 we kind of have to realize that what existed under Yanukovych, the economy that existed back then essentially did not grow. So there was zero economic growth in 2012 and then in 2013. Now economic growth is three and a half, projected to be three and a half percent this year, a bit lower next year, then higher again. So mm -hmm. the economy is back to growth. Mm -hmm. Moreover, uh, this Yanukovych economy was essentially the one of fake stability created by a really very fast spending of uh, foreign exchange reserves on one hand and the other hand attraction of debts. So foreign exchange reserves failed by more than twice during yes. Yanukovych reign and uh, the debts foreign debts uh, rose by about 50%, so by about a third. Which is insane, <coughs> basically, for just three to four years of his... Just for, just for him, years. Yes. Right, so the country. Es essentially the country was already going towards the crisis. And what happened in 2014 was not as much caused by the Russian aggression as caused by the policies of Yanukovych regime, which finally uh, led to this breakdown of this fake stability, because reserves fell too low, the debt level was too high, no more, there was no more way to attract these money or to spend these money and then the economy fell. Mm -hmm. So now the debt is stabilized, the debt levels in US dollar terms have been stable since 2014. The How much did they increase after that huge 50 <coughs> percent uh, They were uh, about jump. 72 billion I think in 2014 and are 75 or something like that now. So essentially uh -huh. they didn't increase at all. They're, they're they didn't flat. increase much? Not at, okay. not at all really, like 3 billion, when, when we're speaking about a level of 70 billion, plus or minus 1 billion is nothing. So we're, spe we're essentially speaking about flat, uh, no growth in foreign debt. Mm -hmm. We're speaking about uh, a growing foreign exchange reserves, so they were 14 billion in early, uh, when Yanukovych fled, in February 2014, and they're 16 and a half now. Uh, they're fluctuating by a billion here, a billion there, but in general they are growing. There is growth. Okay. There is growth so there. Slight still, but... Yes, but still the most important is the eco GDP growth. So the, e the economy is growing again. And now we're not speaking about uh, how to avoid collapse or how to return the economy back to growth at all, mm -hmm. like what was going on in Yanukovych times, we're essentially speaking about how to speed growth up, how to attract more investment, how to get to the levels of growth which would allow Ukraine to catch up with its European and or world peers, mm -hmm. because at this point Ukraine is growing at about the same rate as is what is average for Europe Mm -hmm. or, well, East, Eastern Europe even, or the world. Uh, can we assess the GDP growth now for 2018? And the forecast is 3.5% of GDP. 3.5% already. Yes, that's we the have. IMF forecast, very close is the National Bank forecast, mm -hmm. so they're all more or less close. We think it's going to be 3.5% this year. And a little lower next, next year, year because lower, of political okay. turmoil, double elections, so kind of uh, a slow slower rate of growth, but not by much, about 3%, maybe a little less. And then again, after this political factor is off the table, if, mm -hmm. if the politics is not messed up, if it's not uh, very populist or per se pro-Russian, so if there is no change of course away from these policies that mm -hmm. were inst instituted after Euromaidan, then growth will pick up again. And even more so in 2021, because the period of payments on this so-called peak uh, debt payments, big payments on this foreign, foreign exchange-denominated debt that was amassed back in Yanukovych times, 
So this period is now, it's 2018, 2019 and 2020, but by 2021, the level of these payments will start going lower and it will be easier for Ukraine's economy to grow. But the thing that interests me, how did we survive? How did we basically recover and uh, manage to, to, to get back, well, to get some success, to gain <coughs> some, some progress in, uh, in this macroeconomic uh, deals uh, after this crazy governance of Viktor Yanukovych? Well, essentially, we uh, cut, uh, cut the level, of the share of expenditures of the government in GDP by one-fifth, mm -hmm. which is really an amazing feat. So it was almost half, half of GDP went when we're, or if we also add there the deficit of the NAFTA has uh, company, Right, so it was cut by one fifth. Uh, the level of the deficit of the government budget was about seven percent of GDP in yes, 2013, and now insane. it's two projected for two, two and a half this year, maybe two percent this year. So, a really uh, very, very strong fiscal consolidation, mm -hmm. the so realistic traction of spending, realistic budgets, low deficits. An increase in tariffs by about, what, 10 times at this point, mm -hmm. right? So we went from this, we were almost one of the last and low tariff economies with, with essentially this disarmament state kind of unreformed since the Soviet times. So the tariffs for key utilities was, was, were extremely low, unrealistically low. Now they're going towards market levels, so an increase of more than 10 times, which is what has allowed to partially close this huge gap Mm -hmm. that existed back then. So through really tough measures, really tough economic measures that cost the government of Arsenyi Yatsenyuk, for example, its popularity, this was essentially instituted, mm -hmm. stability was restored and growth and normal normal economic life was restored. Well, but on the other hand, Ukrainian citizens are still living in poverty and we know that this increased utility tariffs, they do uh, beat very much on the wallets of a regular Ukrainian citizen. So when do people, is there any forecast, is there any data, when can people <coughs> feel this, uh, the impact of the reforms? When no. can, can they can feel some progress? Actually, it has already started, right? If we look at real it wages, they've grown uh, s since the uh, last tariff increase in 2016. So in spring 2016 was the last tariff increase. And then the uh, car there was one more right now a month ago, right? So between these, the growth in wages was more than 70%, mm -hmm. and the latest tariff increase was 23%. So, in fact, wages were growing three yeah. times faster than actually the tariffs were growing. Inflation during that time was 35%, so wages were growing at double the rate of inflation. So people are actually already feeling that. Now, the question is when will people actually see that they're catching up to something that they consider a benchmark, let's say Poland, right? When, when they start seeing a kind of similarity in lifestyles here to Poland. Now, that's a different issue because it requires a really sustained and fast economic growth catching up with Poland. So Ukraine has to grow faster than Poland for 10, 15 years, then it will be really clear that yes, uh, yes, the country is catching up. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the main issue now because this actually requires more reform, more structural reforms, uh, effective fight against corruption, privatization, land market, reorganization of internal security agencies and all, all, all the other things that are yet partly unfinished, partly undone, some are done, so more has to be done for Ukraine to catch up. But at least Ukraine is on sound footing now and uh, we, we can speak about catching up at this point. But at this point, can we talk about some basic macroeconomic stability being achieved by Ukraine? Yes, it is. We have it. It is important not to lose it, which is why the IMF program is so critical during this period of peak debt payments, because these peak debt payments actually do constitute a risk to macroeconomic stability, so Ukraine has to be careful to get get through them normally, mm -hmm. repay Could those Could you clarify that, for our audience what payments are you talking about? So we're talking about this next uh, IMF assistance? Yeah, we're essentially speaking about more than 20 billion payments on debts amassed during mostly Yanukovych time mm -hmm. that are coming in 2018, 2019, 2020. So it's a tough period, about let's say 8 billion per year. A lot, a lot to repay, a lot to refinance. So we have to attract financing from the IMF from official sources, from the market, 
to refinance those debts to get get through this period. But then on the other hand, we're waiting for another assistance from the IMF to help yes, us out. Yes, the, uh, the IMF, essentially the IMF tranche, which will be in common, is, is, is a kind of vehicle or tool that Ukraine uses to access the market because mm -hmm. the presence of the IMF program essentially signals to the market participants and also to other official creditors like World Bank or the European Union that Ukraine is on track, mm -hmm. Ukraine is going in the right direction, so Ukraine is a, you can give money to the country, you can loan to the And country. we're speaking about $2 billion, this assistance, yes? Uh, when we're speaking about the EU, this is a direct assistance of 1 billion euros going directly to Ukrainian budget. The World Bank, I think, is about $600 million. The IMF, uh, it does not finance the budget directly, actually, they finance the, for, uh, the reserves of the National Bank. But they are uh, a kind of a signal that everyone is looking for. So mm -hmm. Ukraine really will not have market access or access to other official financing without the IMF. Mm -hmm. So the IMF is the precondition for getting anything from other sources. Well, speaking of the state budget, the Ukrainian Prime Minister Volodymyr Groisman added that the, the, the document, the, this new budget, expands cooperation with international partners and macrofinancial assistance programs. So apart from IMF that we've just talked about, what kind of cooperation does he mean? Well, essentially, he means uh, these two. At this point, there are two big uh, programs of macrofinancial assistance for Ukraine. So one is the European Union ma macrofinancial assistance, which I spoke about about yes. bit more than Wh one billion one euros. Billion. Mm -hmm. And the second is the World Bank, so-called DPL, that's also uh, will hopefully be coming in now until the end of the year. So there's 600 million euros from the EU and 600, I think, billion, uh, I'm sorry, million dollars from the World Bank will be probably coming, hopefully, until the end of this year, then 600 million euros more next year from the EU as second tranche of their assistance. And these are the programs. Again, they're all conditioned on the presence of the IMF program. And essentially, the budget is kind of drafted with, with the idea of receiving this money in mind. Well, if you just spoke about the budget, how would you assess the budget for 2018? I think it's actually pretty good. It's a pretty realistic. tough budget. It's realistic. It's fiscally conservative, despite this being a, a pre-election year. So, you know, usually you'd expect some kind of populist budget, a lot of handouts, nothing of that sort. So the budget is pretty fiscally conservative. The deficit target is uh, c compatible with the IMF program. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no increase in this share of uh, government expenditures or revenues in GDP, so it's, it keeps, keeps, uh, keeps the fiscal pressure on the economy down. So it actually achieves, it's a good budget which achieves what needs to be done. Well, the GDP is expected to be a, about 3%, if I'm not mistaken. And to grow uh, by 3%, that's stipulated in the budget. Maybe it will be a bit lower, but somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm, yes. mm -hmm. And the forecasted inflation could be 7.4%. What does this information mean for regular Ukrainian citizen? If, if these forecasts hold, essentially they will see at this point more of the same. So it's kind of a continuation of the current trend. Now, <coughs> it's unrealistic to expect any really significant speed up in growth in the election year because political risks yeah. will weigh on it. But after that, and especially after the peak debt payments start going down in 2021, we can really, especially if, uh, if the Ukrainian government delivers more reforms, we can so expect by 2021, growth, we can expect mentioned. a speed up. Yes. Well, thank you so much for thank your you. interesting comments and thank you for me being a guest today in our studio. Thank you. That was Pavla Kuchta, Deputy Head of the Strategic Advisory Group for Supporting Ukrainian Reforms. Thank you for watching Head to Head and stay tuned for more with UATV.